Welcome. Welcome back to week two of Dirty Laundry Secrets, and I'm so glad that you're here. It's already starting off to be just a great lesson, and I know you had fun as you walked up and down Laundry Lane, and you learned a lot about your detergent, and I just bet that you will probably never look at your laundry the same way again. And that's okay, as long as it reminds you of your spiritual journey and your journey with Jesus, then that's exactly what it was supposed to do. But today, we're going to move into week two. Week two, where we begin our journey, where we really begin the journey of coming to know the launderer, coming to know Jesus and who he is and what he is in our lives and what he wants from us. And I think so many times that we hold ourselves back because we, we don't really think we're good enough for this journey. We don't really think that we're worthy enough of the love that Christ um sheds on us, you know, day in and day out. We don't think we're worthy of the sacrifice that he made for us. And so many times we think that we need we need to be perfect. And when we're not, we're paralyzed in our tracks and unable to move on. And so this week we're going to really dig into that. And I want to just start by looking at um, a man in the Old Testament. We'll find him in Exodus 2 is where his story begins. But the man of Moses. And Moses is just a great character to study in the Bible. And if you want to flip there to Exodus 2, we'll be reading along in Scripture. I'm going to um, just kind of recap his story to kind of fill you in on um, some of Moses' journey. And while, while y'all find Exodus 2, even though I'm going to kind of paraphrase and tell the story, I just want you to think for a second. I want you to think about the journey that you're on starting today. And... This journey, there's a fork in the road. And let's say today you have to choose which of those lanes that you're going to take. The one lane is a path that you'll go down where you'll continue to look back at your past. You'll look back at your failures, your hurts. You won't be willing to fight through what it takes to lay some bitterness aside and follow that journey out 10 years in your life, 10 years from now. And then stop and think about what your life will look like. Will it look any different from where you are right now? Maybe it'll look a little bit more stressful than right now since you're not able to lay aside some of the things, the the stained garments that hold you back. Or think about the other path that you could take. The other path starting today says, I'm going to be determined to lay aside every stained garment that I have that's holding me back because I want to run that race 10 years from now. 10 years from now, I want to be able to turn back and say, I'm so thankful that I fought the fought and did what I needed to do to lay aside the anger, the bitterness, the frustrations, the unforgiveness, the feelings of not feeling worthy. Some of those things we even bring on ourselves. I want to fight through the fight of laying aside bad habits. I want to fight through and, and lay aside the anger and the fear from being molested or raped. That's the journey I want because 10 years from now, I want my life to reflect a life full of peace and a life full of love in Christ. And if you're not at those crossroads today, the fork in the road having to choose, chances are that you'll soon be there or you know somebody that will be there. Because those forks in the road, they can come out of the blue at any given moment. See, in our lives, we were, you know, I was just taken day by day, step by step. You know, everything was going well. Had a husband, three great kids, and we got involved with, we didn't get involved, we got scammed, I should say, by a scam artist in some property. And the next thing I knew, I was standing at a fork in the road. 
There was anger. There was bitterness. There was all these things. I mean, as far as I would say, even hatred. There were so many things rolling inside of Aline that I stood at the fork of the road one day and said, okay, it's I'm going to have to choose. Either I'm going to choose how to figure this out and take that path. So 10 years down the road, I still have a marriage. I still have kids that want to have a relationship with me. And I can hold my head high knowing that I did nothing wrong. We were scammed. My name is clean and I can still be a light in this world and a light for Christ. Or I knew that if I just crawled in bed and didn't deal with the situation, that 10 years down the road, it wouldn't be any better. The scam artist and the evil ones would still be winning because... All the anger, just the vile, the bitterness would be brewing up inside of me. And it's still causing me to stumble in my tracks. And so if you're in either one of those situations today, if you, if you feel there's things in your past, those stained garments that it's you're, you're fighting through to lay aside, I'm going to challenge you. Make today, make this week the week that you do that. You realize that you're worthy of the future that you want in 10 years, that you don't need to be stuck right here in this, in this mole, in this, this moment for the next 10 years, that it is possible to move ahead. And that's what I want for you. I want you to fight for this. I want you to determine to do whatever it takes to realize in your mind, and it all starts there, that things can be different. And so as we dig into Exodus 2, we find a man, Moses, who I can so relate to on so many levels. It's not even, it's just not even funny. Moses speaks to me. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But as we find out from Moses, as we begin to learn about his birth, he was born in a time where Pharaoh was killing all the boys, the Hebrew boys. And Moses' family was Hebrew. And so for them to save Moses' life, they take him when he's a couple of months old down to the river, put him in the reeds. So hopefully um, he wouldn't be found by Pharaoh and be killed. But of course, Pharaoh's daughter finds him, and she arranges, actually unbeknownst to Moses' family, to have Moses raised by the, his mom and his sister, and they were going to get paid for it. So that's a pretty cool deal, to raise your own children and get paid for it. But anyways, it was, it was a stressful time. Pharaoh's world was a totally different culture, full of um, different language, different religious customs. A different, I mean, Pharaoh's household, you can just imagine being the king was very wealthy versus the Hebrew culture, a different culture, different race, different customs. And so already Moses is in this battle between these two different cultures. And as he gets older, he ends up being adopted back into Pharaoh's household to be raised there where he becomes highly educated. You know, he um, is just a leader there in the community. Well, one day he sees the Egyptians beating up on one of his fellow Hebrew, his kin, his blood, and he kills them. Thinking that nobody is seeing him, he hides the body, you know, and goes about his own business thinking he won't be found out. But of course, he's found out and presented to Pharaoh and Pharaoh is out for Moses again to kill him. So Moses takes off running for years. He's wandering through the desert. He winds up um, in a town, Midian, finds a wife. And there we find him tending sheep, just going about his everyday, ordinary business. And I can only imagine probably what's going through Moses' mind. Because if he's like any of us, he's probably second guessing himself. What could he have done better? Why did he murder that, you know, that, that man? Why in the world was... You know, why did Pharaoh want to kill all the boys when he was born? Why did he have to grow up in two different cultures? Which one's right? Which one's wrong? Just all the crazy questions probably going through Moses' mind, which would be me too. And then we see Moses out tending sheep one day. And he hears the voice of God in a burning bush. The burning bush calls him Moses. Moses, come here. Take off your sandals for where you're standing is holy ground. 
And God and Moses continue to have this conversation. Now, I'm not really sure about you, but just a burning bush talking to me in the middle of the desert would have freaked me out. I mean, it would have been like, is this a mirage? What is going on here? But Moses is, comes, comes closer, takes off his shoes and realizes that, that this is God. God himself speaking directly to Moses. But God's asking him, I, I want you, Moses, you're the guy. I want you to go free my people. I want you to go back and free them of their slavery, of their bondage, of everything that they're in. And the reason why I can so relate to Moses is because here he is in this moment that, you know, with this burning bush, talking to God, having such a spiritual high, I would say. And he feels God impress upon him and say, I'm, this is what I need you to do. How many of you have been there? You know, you're in that moment and you just feel like God impressing upon your heart, like, this is what I need you to do. This is it. And maybe you're like Moses and you say, me? Hey, God, I I think you have the wrong person. Maybe you don't remember this or not, but, you know, there's always been someone wanting to kill me ever since the day I was born. And, And by the way, God, remember, I have this stuttering problem. I don't really talk well. And they're not going to believe me, God, when I go back. They're not. They're not going to believe me because, you know, I murdered a guy there and then took off running because I tried to hide from, you know, hide, cover up what I did. And God's saying, yes, Moses, you're the guy. You are the guy that I need. And this, this is where we are on our journey. I think so many times we want that life that Christ has to give us. That life where we finally surrender and say, Jesus, you're my all. You're everything. I know that you're my Savior. I know that you were crucified on that cross. I know that you rose in three days for me. And then we throw in the, but I feel so unworthy. And yes, while that was such a huge sacrifice to make, I mean, my mind cannot even comprehend it. But yet... We've got to step into that. We've got to realize that we are, we're we're worthy. We're worthy of the calling that God puts on our heart. We're worthy of the journey before us. We're worthy to live a life free of the friction of our past, whatever it is. And see, just like whenever Moses killed the man and then took off trying to hide and cover up, that's what we do. That's what Dirty Laundry Secrets is all about. Because we as humans are so comfortable with, instead of dealing with it, we want to cover it up. And our society these days perpetuates that problem. But we can go back from the beginning of time. Think about it. In Genesis, the beginning of Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve. In his likeness, in their perfect, they're in a perfect world. All the only, the only rule, the only thing that they couldn't do was eat of that one fruit. And that was just too much. I mean, I can just imagine because when somebody tells me that I can't do something, it's like, ah, I, I'm just like, need to do that. So they're human, just like us. And God just says, you know, you have this whole perfect garden. You have this whole perfect place, but just not this one fruit. Well, of course, we all know the rest of the story. You know, they both partook of the fruit. You know, Eve led the way and then Adam and, you know, then they ended up blaming each other. But in the process, after they ate the fruit and they realized they had, were wrong, they realized that they couldn't do anything about it. They took off running. Running. I mean, they were running in the Garden of Eden. They like trying to hide from God, like God's not going to find them. They're the only ones there. And so as they're running and hiding, it's so precious that God says, he runs after them and says, where are you? Where are you? That's precious. So wherever you are on your journey today, in that fork in the road, God's running after you saying, where are you? I want you in my presence. 
I want to live with you. I want to guide you. I want to be your enough. I want to be your enough. That's what God says. So as we dig into this week, week two, and you do your five daily devotionals, I hope God just impresses on your heart more loudly than anything that you can hear that you're enough. You're enough. Jesus died for you because you're enough. I'm enough. He loves us that much. He believes in us that much. He believes that we're enough, that we're enough to follow through on this journey so that other lives can be touched and changed in the process. So I look forward to hearing from you as you dig in. We'll post another post and touch base in another couple of days. I want your comments. I want to know what you're thinking. I want to know what's, what's resonating with you and touching your hearts along this journey. And until then, we'll see you.